it's an Archeo Death interview with Professor Howard Williams and his guest. Welcome everybody to my latest Archeo Death interview. I'm Professor Howard Williams. I'm delighted to have another special guest to talk about all things deathly. Um, so I'll hand over to Dulcie to introduce herself. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Dulcie. Uh, I am a PhD student. Um, I've actually just submitted my thesis, or back in October I did, um, with the University of Bradford. Um, I also did my like BSc archaeology degree there um, alongside my MA in archaeology and identity, which was run by um, Karina Croucher. Um, yeah, I mean, that's about it. Most of my research kind of focuses on sort of funerary archaeology. Um, I look at like gender quite a lot and queer theory. Um, and one of my main interests is kind of like uh, considering the impact of um, archaeology today and how like our views in society can also impact the way that we kind of study and interpret archaeology and history. Oh, what a wonderful introduction and you know what this, <laughs> as, as I was explaining just before we went on on the, on, on the record uh, you know I, I'm really keen to talk to you because we haven't met before but obviously I've been hearing about your research but particularly because of um, I've been having to sort of firefight on various social media channels various you know extreme outraged views and um, you know ignorant and should we say hateful opinions you know in thought you're claiming to have an understanding of what archaeologists do, how archaeologists determine sex, that gender in the archaeological record. And so I really, while I have some grasp of that and I've done my own reading and research and training, you're at the cutting edge. So Dulcie, I, I really value this opportunity to have a talk with you. And I think my audience will, because you will be able to sort of fill in some of the gaps and and to tell us where where research is up to right now. So, I mean, I wondered if you could, you've given us a good introduction to who you are and what, where you came from. And you've been a Bradford through from undergraduate masters and, and PhD, <laughs> but why archaeology, Dulcie? What, what got you into archaeology? Yeah, uh, um, I mean, it's the kind of classic story that most quite a lot of people have. Like, I remember going to museums when I was younger um, and just sort of loving the environment of a museum. And I remember when I was probably like five, there was like this little, uh, like a little sand pit in a museum where you could like brush off the sand from things. And I remember being like, my mind was blown. Um, but I actually did it, I actually did archaeology uh, at A level. Um, yeah, yeah, which is, I mean, yeah, I loved it. Um, I initially kind of took it, I don't know if I should admit this, but I initially took it as a bit of a DOS subject. Um, yeah, no, I sort of like always loved Time Team, another like classic. Um, and yeah, I sort of picked it in my second year of college thinking this is just something quite fun to do, picking it up as an extra like AS level. Um, but I ended up being like totally besotted by it. like. I think, um, although I remember going into my first ever lesson and my teacher, Martin, who literally, Martin probably changed my life. He had a lecture slide on the board saying like, um, we don't do dinosaurs. And I was like, oh no, like. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just walked out. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I'm done. Like, I'm... <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it was like dendrochronology that was like the first thing that really like, I just thought it was so cool, like being nestled away in like a lab somewhere, like looking at tree rings. Like I thought it was amazing. But um, yeah, I think it was, yeah, doing it at A level, like honestly, my teacher, Martin, like I thought, yeah, he was amazing. He made like every lesson really interesting. And I probably wasn't like the best student at that age. Um, and he kind of really gave me like the space to like figure out what I loved and he like really nourished it. and. Yeah, God, I'm sorry, I'm really going on about Martin now, but it's oh, basically but him. <laughs> it's, it's a great shame that the A-level archaeology was lost and um, it was such an important aspect of recruiting great students. But it's also good to hear that, you know, like many people, there's not some, and then when I was two, I had a vision that I would be <laughs> an archaeologist. People need to hear stories of how honestly people do sort of to stumble into archaeology. You know, it sounds yeah. cool, sounds interesting, watch some time team, watch some films or whatever and then it happens and, and I think that's really helpful and honest for other people who are thinking of getting into this it you know it's not some special code of access to archaeology it, it it's yeah. just, we can all sort of start off with perhaps very little knowledge and then you know universities really for most people the first chance they get into the subject I guess yeah 
Yeah, yeah. I think it is such a shame that the A-level is gone because, yeah, I mean, it definitely changed my life. I was looking at doing photography or something. Like, I don't know. I had no idea. And then I found archaeology and was like, yeah, this is like what I want to do. So um, it's a shame that's gone. But yeah, I think it's good that people can just kind of stumble into it, like at university level as well. So preempting what we can discuss about your doctoral research, which is really exciting that you've just literally submitted your thesis and you're waiting for examination still, are you? Yeah, I actually got my thesis delivered today, <laughs> like a little draft copy that I'm going to start going through for my Viva. Um, I've got it here. So pretty happy. There it is. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's I mean, real. good timing to get that delivered today. But um, yeah, waiting for my Viva in, I think it's in April. Fantastic. So you've got... Um... You've got an undergraduate degree and a master's degree behind you. Did you get into mortuary archaeology much? I mean, I'm, I'm shocked if you won't in some regard at Bradford because they they <laughs> they got you know bony things in every well not they do you do lots of things at Bradford but you know the the archaeological science of human osteology or you know is an aspect. But how did your undergraduate and master's degree lead you to the doctoral thesis, or did you do other things? <laughs> yeah. So. Um... I, I like when I was able to choose the different modules um, Bradford University is really good for that. You can pick and choose quite a lot of different things. Um, I found myself sort of always choosing ones that did revolve around like human remains. And I really loved having that kind of like real scientific element of um, doing sort of things like bioarchaeology and like working with Joe Buckbury in the lab at university. Um, and like with the human osteology and paleopathology students. Um, but then I also really loved the kind of combination of that with the kind of more theoretical stuff where I worked more with like Karina and looking at, um, you know, I really loved the kind of sex identification thing and then the combination of how that interprets, how we interpret gender through that and the kind of ins and outs of it. So, um, yeah, like some of my work definitely with like I've always written like essays about kind of gender and identity and yeah always kind of chose the sort of human osteology uh modules um but yeah my past past work like my uh master's um dissertation was uh actually mainly well it was focused on the lack of evidence of menstruation um in the archaeological record so I basically kind of believe that there is evidence of menstruation that it should be detected like we should be able to detect it in the archaeological record so things like menstrual structures potential evidence of like menstrual seclusion or even kind of archaeobotanical evidence related to plants uh, or related to menstruation sorry um but we just haven't really been looking for it or considering no. evidence of menstruation to be kind of worthwhile um to study and that again kind of is also linked to sort of issues with gender um and how we sort of view women or people who menstruate in in modern society so um i also with that research like i gathered data from i think like over 300 people um about just kind of their views on menstruation and I don't know it kind of still showed that it's like a very taboo subject which is then like demonstrated through like the media those kind of ridiculous period adverts that you see of like yeah. women like running through fields and like <laughs> this kind of promotion of like secrecy and shame around menstruation and and also in the wider such like situation is related to women and and people who menstruate but yeah I kind of was thinking like if we can't talk about menstruation today then how can we expect people to study it in in wider society including archaeologists really and that's such an important thing I, just to clarify for people who may not be aware and perhaps you can explain better than I can you know, when you say structures this is from many anthropological observations of societies that structure you know have separate buildings uh, spaces for menstruating and 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 that kind of is that what is that what you meant by that or am I misunderstood? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, so quite a lot of societies um, or different religions or different cultures, um, women do uh, or people who menstruate, sorry, do um, often uh, go away to these kind of menstrual huts or menstrual structures. Um, today, they're viewed quite negatively. It's it, but it varies in different in different cultures and societies. So, for some people, it's like a very empowering. Um, time of the month where you go away to these menstrual structures there's a really good quote from um I can't remember where it is but 
Uh, they sort of say this is the time of the month where you don't have to worry about men and what men are doing and like you know like we just are going to go away and we're going to have this nice time of having our period and like um, but yeah so yeah there's structures around in many different societies and there's the potential that they were used in the past um, there's sort of evidence of uh like birthing structures and it's in some societies and cultures um when people give birth they obviously go away to these structures but they're often used for menstruating people too so yeah so it's both spaces and materials that are, could be associated with that time so you know that you could potentially access it in the archaeological record and this this kind of anthropological work can help frame that i guess that's really interesting I and mean, even the stuff i've seen on the archaeology of sex sexuality and gender tends to sort of only mention it in passing i haven't read exhaustively but i it's it's, it's, it's kind of surprising that there's mm -hmm. you know I've heard it, you know, partially alluded to in various theories about pa particularly Paleolithic stuff, but, you know, not really, you know, taken forward. So it's exciting to see the, these these approaches. Mm, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, that is, there's not much stuff in, in literature, really. All of the stuff that I found that was focused on sort of like fertility was all of these. It, it, like, it was always very focused on on like women's bodies and depictions of women's bodies and like venus figurines and you know all of these fertility rituals and rights but then you're not talking about the main actual aspect of fertility which is yeah. people having a period to then get pregnant so it, yeah for me there was just like a real disconnect there and i sort of thought it's probably to do with the way that we view it today as well and yeah if we can't even sort of say the word period or you, you know you can't say menstruation in archaeological studies and you're obviously not never going to access it if you can't no. talk about it so well so that that was great and you've got a recent <laughs> publication out addressing that very issue which we'll put a, a link in the description but you, your doctoral research has now gone in a related but distinctive <laughs> direction is that fair to say would you like to tell us yeah. about you know what what your your aspirations or your original research questions i'm not i'm not doing a viva voce examination on you here i'm just <laughs> i'm just but i am interested obviously in learning what what you know what what started you off on that that doctoral journey yeah yeah so um quite a lot of my stuff anyway like research and interest was very much focused on sort of gender identity as well and um this kind of like the use of this kind of like binary of like male and female and i think i sort of was it probably did come from like looking at, like reading stuff online and I sort of felt like we yeah I don't know as archaeologists we can sort of change the discourse around sort of like um trans or non-binary identities so yeah but the aim of my research I guess was sort of to like reframe the analytical processes in funerary archaeology to kind of move away from these like restrictive binary paradigms that we often place on archaeological remains um, and then try and use this to like inform and also improve like the discussions that we're having today around trans and non-binary identities and kind of mental health and well-being um yeah wow. I don't know if I've summed it up very well sorry it's no, quite hard so, so, you, know, <laughs> you know from the start well can I can I pitch something at you and you tell me if I've mis misunderstood so from the yeah. very core of the doctoral research was about the past in the present very much thinking about the connections between our frameworks our analysis and how it impacts on our the broader society in which we're working is that a fair characterization yeah 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 absolutely so it yeah it was definitely like yeah trying to use it as um yeah looking at it like in contemporary society and sort of the views that we have and how archaeology can impact those and then also how our views can impact archaeology but um yeah it, yeah it's yeah it's basically about that <laughs> trying to so, trying to use it to inform other people and yeah so have you is there a geographical or chronological focus to your the, the uh, you know your past research or are you are you looking at it in a theoretical way across all archaeology over all time and space and how we take tackle these issues yeah yeah so uh, i haven't got any set time period um i basically looked at uh i what i wanted to do is create like a new method of analyzing um information from various sites or looking at um like human like skeletal remains um where 
and the method I wanted to do with, to create was just to start off an analysis without even considering sex assessment at all or considering sex or gender um, in this like initial stage of the analysis because I sort of realized or I, I felt that when we start with sex assessment and place this kind of binary view of sex and gender on remains, then the rest of the data we gather is going to be kind of pushed into these binary categories of male and female. So uh, I wasn't really like looking to try and work out what was happening in certain societies or like I wasn't I didn't set out to try and, you know, prove that the Iron Age had rigid like views on sex and gender identity it was more about testing a method which is why yeah I kept it really open ah to... right I get you so this is this isn't like the the hunt for you know particular categories that we might describe in our I would be careful how I say it, that we might describe today as say non-binary or um warrior women or uh, yeah. third gender and all these terms that have been floating around you you're, you weren't looking for any particular individuals or uh, that that's one approach I've seen rehearsed this is yeah. a much different kind of setback from that type of yeah problem. absolutely yeah so I didn't want to uh, but yeah I'm not I like I'm not really trying to like place queer people in the past or like I'm not trying to like I'm not setting out to try and find evidence of non-binary or transgender identities in the past or however they may be kind of portrayed or presented it was more about creating a space where these identities could be discovered if they were there and that's where yeah. the method yeah so yeah it was really just about the method and, and sort of yeah, by by getting rid of sex assessment from the initial stage of the analysis, you're not limited to these like binary categories of male and female. And then you can have like a lot more evidence might come to the forefront. Uh, you may get different patterns of evidence when you don't have this kind of rigid view of sex and gender. So I'm not saying don't consider it ever. I just think when you when you start off in the analysis, you know, sex and gender isn't kind of the be all and end all. But it, is, but it is, isn't it? For many traditional studies, it's almost, yeah. and I, I, I must admit, it's so embedded in the way we do things, uh, tell me if you think I'm off mark here, that, that it's, it's, it is naturalised. That's the whole point, is it's naturalised. It's like the, the, the pink baby, blue baby clothes. Is we are, you know, in an archaeological you know, narrative that I'm just making up of discovering a site, doing preliminary excavations, finding some skeletons, the you know, maybe even in the grave if there's an archaeologist on site but, but or certainly in the lab it's almost the first primary and you see this spill over into tv i was because this was at the forefront of my mind i was just watching a certain tv program documentary series and it's this obsessive is it a man is it a woman is, you know yeah. well it's, it looks like a 14 year old so we probably won't say or whatever the result is or oh it looks look, look at this angle of the skyatic notch or whatever it may be you know it's definitely and it's that it's it's that popular fixation as well it's not just our practice as academics and commercial archaeologists or museum based it's also that pu public face of us is we look like we're obsessed with sex estimation it, it, yeah and yeah. i hadn't really i hadn't really hadn't really got through in my brain how how it looks <laughs> yeah yeah that yeah no that it's it's so true like in in so many studies or like you said in in tv programs and <laughs> things like that it it is sort of the first port of call and and I do I do get it you know sex and gender identity can be really significant and can be really important and but yeah I just think when you start off with it you're then limiting the the data and the results to sort of fit these categories like grave goods are always kind of assigned male and female like it's to me it's like it's mad like you know an object I get the kind of it, I don't know it's all the personification of objects really isn't it but when you start off and you identify someone as a female in the grave and then you see they're buried with a sword people are like whoa maybe they're transgender or, or something but it's like well that's just your viewpoint that has been put on it and if you didn't start with sex assessment you wouldn't be questioning their gender identity you wouldn't be you would just view it as someone with a sword and maybe that can give you better data than putting a sex a rigid sex category onto it that's really interesting because i think um at least in my informal conversations with people a lot of people i i um, you know i i've got a sense of is that this this hunt for individuals fetishizing mm -hmm. particular graves as 
being examples of particular modern day identities can be enabling, can be really positive, can be a, a focus of conversation and education, but it can also be quite, um, you know, biologically essentialist. You're basically saying to be of those categories today, you have to have something biologically rooted or aberrant or disjointed about you. And that's what, I, so there's not, whatever we say can potentially be quite harmful in terms of such a precise or determinate you know identification of individuals um but that that approach seems much more healthy so you are you sort of suggesting we just basically we ask different questions and different we, we start from a different stance yeah so it's yeah my method is sort of just um trying to yeah just avoid avoid sex at the beginning <laughs> putting it as simply as I can just try and when you're looking at the remains um like or looking at uh, already published data just take out any of the sex like categorizations in it and and a lot more data can come to the forefront like so you know sometimes sometimes there is evidence of of quite rigid sex and gender categorization or treatment in in death um and sometimes there isn't sometimes stuff isn't actually always male and female and um, mm. there's more kind of ambiguity in in the data and in the results so it's definitely important to still consider sex and gender identity and note any kind of patterns that do come to the forefront that may be related to sex but by removing yeah by removing it from the initial step in the analysis it kind of I think it kind of I don't know opens up uh, yeah a lot more questions you can get a lot more from the data I think that's interesting. So are you um are you suggesting that perhaps we um the way we approach this is not so much about the identity of the dead person, but of the the kind of the the mourners, the survivors, whatever term you prefer, that that that, that you, because a lot of at least popular audiences I encounter really struggle with that concept. They think people are literally tripping over into graves with the things they had on them. Um and when I try and explain, well, it's not as easy that whether it's like modern day or it's in the past, you know, yes, the dead are agents of their own, they can be important, but they're not the only actors in the funeral. I mean, do you think, do you think that's one of the things that we still struggle with in archaeology, or do you think that's only popular perception? Yeah, no, yeah, I think it is definitely something that, that um, we sort of still struggle with, like the, you know, there's the classic, the dead don't bury themselves, and yeah. Um, yeah, so sometimes the stuff in the graves aren't um, representative of someone's gender identity, potentially. It might be representative of something completely irrelevant to their gender identity. And yeah, the, 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 the grave, the burial is like a snapshot of, of someone's life and it doesn't give us everything. And I think sometimes we do put a lot of potentially too much emphasis on finding out the identity of someone. And, you know, I'm not trying to we should like <laughs> we should try and find out the identity of these people and it's so interesting to uh you know study that but um yeah I think we've got to kind of shift it a little bit shift it up and uh try and bring more like questions into it or yeah just at least note that um not everything is sex and gender related in a burial no. It's, no. it's not always representative of that person like you said who's died it's the, the mourners as well age kinship ethnicity a host of other factors can can can, yeah. can play a role as much as anything else and um so so what do you think the bigger implications for archaeology moving forward i mean i don't know maybe you're too you know your focus is very much on your doctoral thesis and what it's achieved but what do you think you know archaeologists at large need to you know more broadly as a community need to be doing with this kind of discussion are we are we in the right place yet for tackling these current mm -hmm. cultural debates or should we just step back from them and keep quiet I, I'm a little unsure what we should be doing really in terms of yeah. trying to explain this complex challenges of interpreting the archaeological record yeah yeah I think um it, yeah I think it's I think it's really important to look at the kind of role that us like we as archaeologists can play in these kind of debates that are happening today so another like sort of half of my research is looking at the contemporary stuff so I use archaeological um I used evidence the one the study that I did like of trying to shift up the way we look at things the method that I um made but then also other case studies um that can kind of uh 
highlight or demonstrate the kind of uh, possibility of varying different gender identities or is mm. a way to question them. So things like the Burka warrior, um, like Queen Hatshepsut and like loads of other ones, including also contemporary evidence. So um, like drag kings, drag queens and people that kind of play with their gender identity. And I use those in these like workshops with um, like members of the public just to see whether archaeology uh, is like a good um, way to open up these discussions around sex and gender identity. Um, and it, it is basically, uh, yeah, it's a really good way archaeology can really be used to open up these conversations. Um, so some of my participants, I won't go into like too much of detail, course. But, but some of my um, <laughs> But participants basically said that the archaeological evidence that was provided to them in these workshops was a really good way of providing sort of different perspectives and different evidence and different views. And it kind of really challenged people's understanding of the topics. So some people came in to the sessions saying that they didn't really understand things like pronouns and they didn't understand the kind of they them pronouns and um they the the workshops basically provided this kind of safe space of discussing uh like all of these different issues that have, are around today basically so people would start off by talking about the archaeological evidence and then they would go oh i've actually got a non-binary friend and maybe they would be interested in this or or they would go yeah it would lead on to these contemporary or modern debates that are happening um and this kind of like yeah, it led to people having this kind of better understanding of sex and gender identity and the complexities of it. And then this, that then led to like an increase in confidence of participants when talking about the topic. And then that then led to them continuing these discussions outside of the workshop with this kind of new perspective on it. Um, and by kind of continuing these discussions, they're sort of spreading this like education and awareness of these issues, which, I think can help work towards improving society. Um, so I think we definitely, sorry, I feel like I really rambled on there, but no, <laughs> like, you didn't. that was very clear. Thank you. Yeah, I think like we we really need to be getting more involved in these debates. Um, I think like there's this kind of age old idea that like archaeologists will dig up your bones in a thousand years and they won't care about your gender. They'll just see like male or female and that's kind of used in these quite transphobic arguments and it, it's not even true like we as archaeologists we do care about gender identity and we do care about the um potential difference between a sex skeleton and the gender identity of that person and um yeah I think we just definitely need to get involved in these debates even if they're kind of a bit uncomfortable and yeah we need to be kind of showing that we don't do that we don't just dig people up in a thousand years and assign a sex to them well we sort of do but <laughs> it's, it's a difficult one though isn't it because obviously i knew that that has been around for a while this fictional future archaeology rhetoric archaeologists will only care about uh, but i hadn't realized the scale of it until relatively recently via social media and obviously depending on one's individual identity one won't necessarily have this kind of hate targeted at you and, mm. uh, and then suddenly you reveal people around me who are, do identify differently I just this is all they hear about archaeology all they hear about archaeology is nothing we've actually found it's all about a fictional notional conceptual future make-believe archaeologists who will apparently according to criteria that are based on utter ignorance and, and and you know misrepresentation of our discipline going to be saying x y and z and i i wondered whether we've been as a collective slow on the ball at picking this up we've been so so much right right uh, justified frustrations with popular misconceptions of archaeology and archaeologists in other fields, including the idea that we're secretly hiding evidence of ancient aliens or we're hiding evidence of, you know, pre post last uh, last ice age, you know, white civilizations yeah. that ruled the planet, you know, all these kind of dangerous racial racialized hyper diffusionist, you know, neo colonial, mm -hmm. whatever terms you want to use, white supremacist 
you know, basically narratives. They're, they are obviously been a fixation of uh, a lot of archaeologists' attention in fighting com pseudo archaeology. But I, I, I don't know what you would feel if I said, and I have said this in a TikTok, and I, therefore I, I'd like your views on whether you think I'm correct or I, you think it's perhaps misleading. Is that this this narrative of a future fictional archaeologist who will determine you either male or female on a binary is one of the most pernicious pseudo archaeologies at the moment around. And I don't know if I um, maybe I'm just late to the party and didn't realise this, but I haven't really seen, you know, because we've been focused elsewhere. I wonder whether as an archaeology community, we've just kind of missed the, missed a point here. And I don't know if that's I've, I've missed, you know, please tell me if you think that's a unfair characterization. No, I think I think it's true. I don't. Yeah, I don't want to. um be too harsh on archaeologists I guess but I but I don't I don't think we've done enough like at all I think it has been something that's kind of gone under the radar a little bit um and like you said previously like some people aren't aware of it um because they maybe they do identify with the sex they were assigned at birth and so they don't they're often people aren't maybe aware of the transphobic arguments mm. that are going around that include archaeologists um so yeah I think it's great that it is finally sort of people are being made aware of it and the role that archaeology is is playing in it but um yeah I, I don't I don't think we've done enough the the example that I use um when I talk to people about it is do you remember the uh the like Cadbury's advert the chocolate advert Easter hunt where they kind of they really the yeah, yeah they yeah they really didn't do very well with that but um there was an absolute outrage from archaeologists yeah. online and rightfully so it was you know it wasn't very good um and the outrage from archaeologists online led to the um like advertisement being taken down and the Cadbury's rehashed what their advertisement was going to be and that's a really good example of how we can get involved in in debates and in contemporary issues by standing up to things but then on like social media but then there was uh someone I, I obviously won't name names but it's uh someone in the Tory party um sort of wrote a letter saying um about sex and gender identity and really pushing this quite transphobic argument that you're either male or female and it's been that way for the whole of human existence and she said it was something like 500 million years of human existence and yes. silence from archaeologists and I'm like, that, that's using, we need we need to be getting involved in these debates to, to say that that evidence is wrong and, and she's wrong and don't try and use archaeology and this evidence of male and female from archaeologists in your transphobic arguments. It's, it's really dangerous and we need to stand up to that, I think. I mean, it's not the first time that that happened. I can't remember exactly when, but there was another government minister talking about farming as as old as humanity and other such, you know, there's been, you know, and it's not just the same political you know, um, you know, angle. You often it is because they happen to be the government party for the, in the UK for the last more years than my brain can cope with. But my point yeah. is, it can be across the spectrum because transphobia and you know, um, you know, um, the trans panic affects many different parts of our society and other other dimensions, not just simply transphobia, but other aspects of uh, of this of this misunderstanding and and ignorance and flagrant hatred towards minority groups marginalized groups in different ways so you know it's not always just the same political but you're right is that these are areas and I, I when i was talking about criticizing the archaeological community i mean me as course <laughs> you know i'm not i'm not saying oh here i am outside of it look at me I, i'm saying i have also been slow at realizing the scale and character of this so i've obviously that's why i i you know but but equally you know if we're going to move on these issues it does it does frustrate me. And that's a brilliant example. The Freddo's chocolate uh, um, in my uh, 20, 20, 2022 book, um, we had a contribution uh, addressing that whole how that happened. And mm. some of it was just a perfect storm in a positive way for once where archaeologists from different backgrounds and perspectives could speak up. But it does beg a belief how other major social issues don't get that kind of response from the archaeological profession organizations and and we have the expertise to address that issue and i appreciate that not every individual scholar can can do that work but then equally if we leave it to only individuals who rep identify according to those categories we're basically leaving them as a scapegoats for for getting all the hate and the abuse in the press i feel i think so yeah. yes i think so it does 
I think as a collective, we could be doing more. And I hope your your research it sounds like your research is going to help shift things along in that regard. Um, do, do you think that um, do you think that this this is something we should be, you know, how how do we do that? How how do you, should we do that? I mean, obviously, social media is one thing, but is there? Do you think there are other mechanisms we can use? I mean, having your thesis out there, open access, and hopefully with publications, will help a great deal. But do you think there's other mechanisms we should be using? I don't know. I think it's really hard. I think that I think the issue at the moment, as well as within archaeology, is that you almost have to kind of actively choose to study gender, like in any kind of detail with it. But gender like and the issues that that archaeologists face with gender are like a rife throughout everything that you study within archaeology yet you have to choose like a gender module or you have to choose to write an essay on gender like it's it, but it should be underpinned throughout I think and my friend Ethan actually did his thesis uh, his um master's dissertation on kind of looking at where gender fits into the archaeological uh, like curriculum and how that should actually be improved like I think we shouldn't be treating gender archaeology as this like niche subject that you have to choose to to partake in and it should be something that everyone gets a bit of understanding of everyone's basically made to take a viking module at some point like make everyone take a I gender make my students do it. No, no. yeah but i know <laughs> yeah. you mean no. no it's good though. like um yeah like no criticism there like i think it's great but i think gender should be one that is or or it should be taught in every module at, at least at some point because it really underpins so much of it and i think that's where people feel that they are kind of excused from these debates because they see it as something they have to actively choose to partake in but it, I, I think it should be compulsory I think we should be like really stepping up to it but it's it's really hard to do there's no kind of right or wrong answer really it's, it's I, I'm smiling I'm smiling in agreement but also remembering <laughs> when I was a PhD student we had it was a lot as a running joke that one of the mature students um, would who was on the same program as me and it was a running joke then right because we just had uh, Roberta Gilchrist join join us right? nice. and we yeah. had other female archaeologists and also gender was a theme in many of the modules and he had this line he would say he'd go we'd, we'd have a conversation we'd talk about some issue or something he goes yeah I don't do gender yeah. <laughs> and we used to Classic, just we, yeah. used to, we, we used to well actually to his face and behind his back we just used to use that line all the time as a running joke if we didn't understand anything I'd just go yeah I don't do gender like what does that even mean how can you be an interpreter of the archaeological record and a communicator, a researcher, a teacher, if you don't do gender. I mean, I, so, know. I mean, I, you know, I would love to have been able to talk to you with a sense that that is so hilariously out of date. That, that but, but it's not. And that is sad that we're mm. in a society in the 2020s where, you know, we, we're still struggling to to fully integrate these approaches within our yeah. theory method practice at every stage and of course it affects us as practitioners doesn't it because we have genders too and you know it's, it's not just you know, uh, yeah it's it's um rant <laughs> you know but yeah it's, it's, it's shocking that we're in this situation but good that we're we're having these conversations Do, yeah. is there anything we've missed Dulcie that we you think we should have addressed as part of what you're doing and I appreciate you're in a very sort of delicate position that's not yet defended your thesis you can't give us like all the here's the three th takeaway points or something but so I don't want to be mean and say give me two things we should do or what two put you know it's, it's unfair on you but is there anything else you'd like to, to point out about your ongoing research and what you hope to do next yeah I, I think the main the main thing is um sort of just as archaeologists, I think we need to be more aware of the kind of power that we can hold in in certain debates and certain discussions, like especially around sex and gender identity. Like it's it's really easy and we have a really good way, actually, of kind of opening up these discussions by showing, you know, archaeological evidence of potential diversity. Um, and it can really improve people's mental health and well-being. Like it really gives people it gives these like diverse or marginalized groups um, like a voice in constructing their own pasts. And it's really important for improving mental health and well-being. It provides this kind of like sense of history and heritage and community to 
you know, people that may be suffering with their mental health because of their gender identity or sorry, not because of their gender identity, because of the issues that they face in society because of it. Um, and yeah, I just think we need to be actively taking more of a role or or um, showing that we can take an active role um, in kind of helping improve people. <laughs> I think we, we underestimate how much the public, A, um, don't expect us to provide simple answers. They don't want done done down. They want, as you, and that's what I was going to say, you're doing it through workshops. You're not just definitively pontificating, authoritatively determining what people should think about the Iron Age or the, the early Middle Ages or whatever. You, what you're doing is you're engaging them in the stories and that is helping them. Uh, and that is so important, I think. And, and so uh, the way you've characterised that is so, fills me with a lot of hope because I think it's, and I think the, the public are ready for that. The public don't need another glossy documentary or another glossy soundbite. They want that. They want this depth. They want this. They're, they're not stupid. They're not. Uh, they, they, and, but they need these as mechanisms to help facilitate these conversations. And I think that's a brilliant way of putting it. So thank you so much. That's really helped me as well think through these issues. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think the point Yeah, that you made about like facilitating these conversations is really important like I think that's actually what we need to be focusing on now is not going like I didn't want to put this evidence in front of people in the workshops and go the Burqa warrior is example of transgender identity in the past like we don't know it might be it might not be who knows yeah but by having something there that can be questioned and can be discussed um and this kind of ambiguity or yeah it opens up these discussions and 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 actually that really shows that it gets good results like people love having a chat like people love having a conversation about it and and that's where you actually challenge people's views and I had a couple of quite transphobic comments said in these workshops and it was actually about facilitating that and 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 showing that um people can change their mind if they have better access to education on 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 these issues and yeah opening up to facilitate those discussions is really significant this is really interesting. And yes, it is about changing hearts and minds and or just making people aware of these issues beyond the, the, the ideological diatribes that people experience on social media. So I hope that this, this is the start of much more of this kind of method and approach. So, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's all good. And I think, you know, having this conversation is going to hopefully shed some light and make some connections and um, certainly um, you know, I, I'm, I've, I've already heard from a couple of uh, non-archaeology colleagues how keen they are to hear more on this, but not from me, but from people who are, you know, mm -hmm. doing this kind of research. Because um, I've always al already been honest that I have, a, I'm not. This isn't my bag. This isn't exactly what I'm, I don't do gender. No, of course I do. Yeah. But, but, but you know, I'm not exactly doing this area. So, um, so this is really helpful. Thank you so much, Dulcie. Um, I, I would. I just want to say we'll put links to your publications and other contacts in the description and yeah. just I really wish all the very best uh, to you um, for this uh, Viva Voce examination that's impending and also for the what comes next for you and your career because it sounds like you've got so many great ideas that are going to move things forward. Thank you so much for sharing some of them here today. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been really, it's been really nice to just have a chat about it, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Howard Williams on YouTube. In addition, consider following the Archaeodeath WordPress blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.